Hey, we're going to go over the basics of a lab report for IB Biology. And I'm going to do this fairly quickly, moving between this document with some tips and an actual uh, sample write-up. Okay, so you can pause it and take a look in more detail at these various parts. But uh, first of all, in the beginning, let's just talk about, let's focus on the design aspect. So this is the planning stage, and IB provides you with three main categories uh, for the design aspect. In the future, this may change, but for now, uh, let's focus on these first three and what is required to get complete. And I have some extra notes down here and a few things to help uh, make sure you don't miss, okay, based on some of these criteria. Now, uh, one of the things that you're going to notice immediately is that if you just look at these three categories, complete, partial, and not at all. This is what we've provided ourselves, but the IB provides everything that's here. And it's very vague uh, in all kinds of IB biology workshops. This is one common thing that everybody always talks about. It's not exactly clear, and I think they deliberately kept it gray so that there can be a lot of flexibility, but then that makes it very difficult for um, staying consistent and moderation. But here are the tips that we picked up uh, over the years. So the first thing in the beginning, define the problem and select the variables. Pretty clear, I think, uh, but just make sure that your aim is there. Your aim should include the independent and the dependent variable in there. Um, it's a nice, not a bad idea to throw in the units into the aim as well in parentheses. Um, overall, the controlled variables, you need to make sure there are enough controlled variables, but I'll talk about that throughout the rest of this. And you have to make sure your variables are quantitatively described and so um, I've suggested that you use something I've given a document that looks like this it's kind of a, uh, a planning packet if you will and the aim follow this format hypothesis will come I'll discuss that in a second and organizing the variables into a table like this with the independent variable written here dependent variable and a list of all the controlled variables and at the right here you'll discuss your fair testing so how are you going to be manipulating your independent variable, how are you manipulating your dependent variable, why are you interested in them, fill that out. And this is most important for each of the controlled variables, you can see in this example over here. For each of the controlled variables, make sure you list it, give the actual unit, and then talk about how you are going to keep that controlled and why it's necessary to keep that controlled. So you can see in this Daphne experiment there are several. You should be aiming for at least five controlled variables, I think, to be safe. Don't forget the units, of course, as well. Okay, anything else left to be underneath here? Uh, do the table, as I've just shown you, the table that's provided in the sample template. Include all relevant units. Avoid the word amount. Use things like volume, mass, uh, the number of, don't say amount. Um, concentration can be expressed in grams per milliliter, parts per million. There's various other ways. That's not concentration. Just make sure you have your units correct. At least three control variables. I'm updating that to five, not percentage. And make sure everything is quantitative as well. And the next category, uh, basically, if you went through and did this table, as I've suggested, in detail, then that should actually take care of this category. This, this designs a method for the effective control of variables. Because by talking about the fair testing in the how and the why columns here, you're automatically going to be thinking about that. And then when you write your actual, uh, your method as well, you can, it'll be easier because you've already listed some of those things out. So in your method, you should try to include uh, some of those specific things to control as well too. This is a little bit short in the lack of detail, but from what I've noticed, this more than makes up for the lack of detail in the method, so keep that in mind. You must explain how, oh, this is all taken care of. If you fill out the table in detail, I think you should be okay here. Um, yeah, anything else here? Don't mention it, don't just, for the why you want to control something, don't just say, because it will affect my experiment and repeat that over and over again. If you need to keep the light intensity constant, why? Is that necessary? Talk about how changing the light intensity, what effect would light intensity, changing light intensity actually have on your experiment? Obviously, if you're doing a photosynthesis experiment and you're trying to investigate carbon dioxide concentration, obviously keeping the light intensity 
uh, constant would be very important. If you don't, well, we all know that light is another factor that influences photosynthesis. So talk about that, if you can get into detail about how the light would affect that experiment. And finally, the last one develops a method that allows for the collection of sufficient relevant data. Um, honestly, when I take a look at the data table, that gives me a really good idea if this has actually happened here. So um, what do we want to say? If you don't connect enough, uh, conduct enough trials, and that's going to be that's going to make it very difficult for you to analyze the experiment, and it's going to make it almost impossible for you to do any kind of statistical analysis. Just calculating an average is not enough in my opinion and for most of the feedback that I've heard from other biology teachers as well but we'll discuss that more in the um, data analysis section but for now if you don't have enough data to do any data analysis then perhaps you haven't collected enough uh, relevant data uh, sufficient relevant data just means uh, is the data you're collecting actually addressing your hypothesis and your aim and your variables so be careful about that and watch out for appropriate data ranges if you're investigating temperature effects on enzymes then is your are your temperature ranges uh, large enough to actually you know what are we interested about in enzymes. We're also interested in what happens after we get to the denaturing range of temperatures. So if you're, if you're talking about denaturing but you've only um, investigated a range of temperatures up to maybe 35 or 40 degrees, um, maybe that's not a large enough range. So be careful about that as well. What else do I have to say here? Enough trials. Uh, five by five, let me add in here. Five by five. You hear a lot of people talking about five by five. What does that mean? That means five different readings, five different readings, so five different temperatures if you're investigating, and five repeats of each of those temperatures. And so you'll actually get quite a bit of data to be, be able to at least do some kind of uh, line graph or analysis of that. And if, you're, if, if you have five repeated trials for each of those, then you could take a couple of those and analyze them to see if there's a significant difference between them using a t-test or some other type of uh, analysis analytical method um, are you really measuring the correct variable correct range of data okay, I've talked about that already the key point here is if you don't do any trials you can't even calculate an average if you can't calculate an average then you won't be able to actually do any sufficient statistical analysis and that's automatically going to mess you up here and in the next section as well too. Alright, if you have any questions please post them. Alright, thank you.